My boss is in flames, my son is older than me, please, Zeus, make it stop. I dreamed I was driving the sun chariot across the sky. I had the top down in Maserati mode. I was cruising along, honking at jet planes to get out of my way, enjoying the smell of cold stratosphere, and bopping to my favorite jam, Alabama shakes, rise to the Sunday. I was thinking about transforming the spider into a Google self-driving car. I wanted to get out my ute and play a scorching solo that would make Brittany Howard proud. Then a woman appeared in my passenger seat. You've got to hurry, man. I almost jumped out of the sun. My guest was dressed like a Libyan queen of old. I should know. I dated a few of them. Her gown swirled with red, black, and gold floral designs. Her long dark hair was crowned with a tiara that looked like a curved miniature ladder, two gold rails lined with rungs of silver. Her face was mature but stately, the way a benevolent queen should look. So definitely not Hera, then. Besides, Hera would never smile at me so kindly. Also, this woman. Wore a large metal piece symbol around her neck, which did not seem like Hera's style. Still, I felt I should know her. Despite the elder hippie vibe, she was so attractive that I assumed we must be related. Who are you? I asked. Her eyes flashed a dangerous shade of gold, like a feline predator's. Follow the voices. A lump swelled in my throat. I tried to think straight, but my brain felt like it had been recently run through a Vitamix. I heard you in the woods, were you, were you speaking a prophecy? Find the gates. She grabbed my wrist. You've got her find them first, you dig. But the woman burst into flames. I pulled back my cinched wrist and grabbed the wheel as the sun chariot plunged into a nosedive. The Maserati morphed into a school bus, a mode I only used when I had to transport a large number of people. Smoke filled the cabin. Somewhere behind me, a nasal voice said, by all means, find the gates. I glanced in the rearview mirror. Through the smoke, I saw a portly man in a mauve suit. He lounged across the back seat, where the troublemakers normally sat. Hermes was fond of that seat. But this man was not Hermes. He had a weak jawline, an overlarge nose, and a beard that wrapped around his double chin like a helmet strap. His hair was curly and dark like mine, except not as fashionably tousled or luxuriant. His lip curled as if he smelled something unpleasant. Perhaps it was the burning seats of the bus. Who are you? I yelled, desperately trying to pull the chariot out of its dive. Why are you on my bus? The man smiled, which made his face even uglier. My own forefather does not recognize me. I'm hurt. I tried to place him. My cursed mortal brain was too small, too inflexible. It had jettisoned for a thousand years of memories like so much ballast. I, I don't, I said. I'm sorry. The man laughed as flames licked at his purple sleeves. You're not sorry yet, but you will be. Find me the gates. Lead me to the oracle. I'll enjoy burning it down. Fire consumed me as the sun chariot careened toward the earth. I gripped the wheel and stared in horror as a massive bronze face loomed outside the windshield. It was the face of the man in purple. Fashioned from an expanse of metal larger than my bus. As we hurtled toward it, the features shifted. And became my own. Then I woke, shivering and sweating. Easy. Someone's hand rested on my shoulder. Don't try to sit up. 
Naturally, I tried to sit up. My bedside attendant was a young man about my age, my mortal age, with shaggy blonde hair and blue eyes. He wore doctor's scrubs with an open ski jacket, the words Oxmo Mountain stitched on the pocket. His face had a skier's tan. I felt I should know him. I'd been having that sensation a lot since my fall from Olympus. I was lying in a cot in the middle of a cabin. On either side, bunk beds lined the walls. Rough cedar beams ribbed the ceiling. The white plaster walls were bare except for a few hooks for coats and weapons. It could have been a modest abode in almost any age, ancient Athens, medieval France, the farmlands of Iowa. It smelled of clean linen and dried sage. The only decorations were some flower pots on the windowsill, where cheerful yellow blooms were thriving despite the cold weather outside. Those flowers. My voice was hoarse, as if I'd inhaled the smoke from my dream. Those are. From Delos, my sacred island. Yep, said the young man. They only grow in and around cabin seven, your cabin. Do you know who I am? I studied his face. The calmness of his eyes, the smile resting easily on his lips, the way his hair curled around his ears, I had a vague memory of a woman, an old country singer named Naomi Solis, whom I'd met in Austin. I blushed thinking about her even now. To my teenage self, our romance felt like something that I'd watched in a movie a long ago time, a movie my parents wouldn't have allowed me to see. But this boy was definitely Naomi's son. Which meant he was my son too. Which felt very, very strange. Your will solace, I said. My, our, erm, yeah, will agreed. It's awkward. My frontal lobe did a 180 inside my skull. I listed sideways. Whoa, there. Will steadied me. I tried to heal you, but honestly, I don't understand what's. Wrong. You've got blood, not a chair. You're recovering quickly from your injuries, but you're vital. Signs are completely human. Don't remind me. Yeah, well. He put his hand on my forehead and frowned in concentration. His fingers trembled slightly. I didn't know any of that until I tried to give you nectar. Your lips started steaming. I almost killed you. Ah. I ran my tongue across my bottom lip, which felt heavy and numb. I wondered if that explained my dream about smoke and fire. I hoped so. I guess Meg forgot to tell you about my condition. I guess she did. Will took my wrist and checked my pulse. You seem to be about my age, 15 or so. Your heart rate is back to normal. Ribs are mending. Nose is swollen, but not broken. And I have acne, I lamented. And flab. Will tilted his head. You're mortal, and that's what you're worried about. You're right. I'm powerless. Weaker even than you puny demigods. Gee, thanks. I got the feeling that he almost said dad but managed to stop himself. It was difficult to think of this young man as my son. He was so poised, so unassuming, so free of. Acne. He also didn't appear to be awestruck in my presence. In fact, the corner of his mouth had started twitching. Are are you amused? I demanded. Will shrugged. Well, it's either find this funny or freak out. My dad, the god Apollo, is a 15-year-old, 16, I corrected. Let's go with 16. A 16-year-old mortal, lying in a cot in my cabin, and with all my healing arts, which I got from you, I still can't figure out how to fix you. There is no fixing this, I said miserably. I am cast out of Olympus. My fate is tied to a girl named Meg. It could not be worse. Will laughed, which I thought took a great deal of gall. Meg seems cool. 
She's already poked Conestal in the eyes and kicked Sherman Yarn in the crotch. She did what? She'll get along just fine here. She's waiting for you outside, along with most of the campers. Will's smile faded. Just so you're prepared, they're asking a lot of questions. Everybody is. Wondering if your arrival, your mortal situation, has anything to do with what's been going on at camp. I friend. What has been going on at camp? The cabin door opened. Two more demigods stepped inside. One was a tall boy of about thirteen, his skin burnished bronze and his cornrows woven like DNA helixes. In his black wool peacoat and black jeans, he looked as if he'd stepped from the deck of an 18th century whaling vessel. The other newcomer was a younger girl in olive camouflage. She had a full quiver on her shoulder, and her short ginger hair was dyed with a shock of bright green, which seemed to defeat the point of wearing camouflage. I smiled, delighted that I actually remembered their names. Austin, I said. And Kaylor, isn't it? Rather than falling to their knees and blubbering gratefully, they gave each other a nervous glance. So it's really you, Kayla said. Austin friend. Meg told us you were beaten up by a couple of thugs. She said you had no powers and you went hysterical out in the woods. My mouth tasted like burnt school bus upholstery. Meg talks too much. But you're mortal? Kaylor asked. As in completely mortal. Does that mean I'm going to lose my archery skills? I can't even qualify for the Olympics until I'm 16. And if I lose my music? Austin shook his head. No, man, that's wrong. My last video got, like, 500,000 views in a week. What am I supposed to do? It warmed my heart that my children had the right priorities, their skills, their images, their views on YouTube. Say what you will about God's being absentee parents, our children inherit many of our finest personality traits. My problems should not affect you, I promised. If Zeus went around retroactively yanking my divine power out of all my descendants, half the medical schools in the country would be empty. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame would disappear. The tarot card reading industry would collapse overnight. Austin's shoulders relaxed. That's a relief. So if you die while you're mortal, Kayla said, we won't disappear. Guys, Will interrupted, why don't you run to the big house and tell Trin that our, our patient is conscious. I'll bring him along in a minute. And, I'll uh, see if you can disperse the crowd outside, okay? I don't want everybody rushing Apollo at once. Kaylor and Austin nodded sagely. As my children, they no doubt understood the importance of controlling the paparazzi. As soon as they were gone, Will gave me an apologetic smile. They are in shock. We all are. It'll take some time to get used to whatever this is. You do not seem shocked, I said. Will laughed under his breath. I'm terrified. But one thing you learn as head counselor, you have to keep it together for everyone else. Let's get you on your feet. It was not easy. I fell twice. My head spun, and my eyes felt as if they were being microwaved in their sockets. Recent dreams continued to churn in my brain like river silt, muddying my thoughts, the woman with the crown, and the peace symbol, the man in the purple suit. Lead me to the oracle. I'll enjoy burning it down. The cabin began to feel stifling. I was anxious to get some fresh air. One thing my sister Artemis and I agree on, every worthwhile pursuit is better outdoors than indoors. Music is best played under the dome of heaven. Poetry should be shared in the agora. Archery is definitely easier outside, as I can attest after that one time I tried target practice in my father's throne room. 
and driving the sun, well, that's not really an indoor sport either. Leaning on Will for support, I stepped outside. Kayla and Austin had succeeded in shooing the crowd away. The only one waiting for me, oh, joy and happiness, was my young overlord, Meg, who had apparently now gained fame at camp as crotch kicker McCaffrey. She still wore Sally Jackson's hand-me-down green dress, though it was a bit dirtier now. Her leggings were ripped and torn. On her bicep, a line of butterfly bandages closed a nasty cut she must have gotten in the woods. She took one look at me, scrunched up her face, and stuck out her tongue. You look yuck. And you, Meg, I said, are as charming as ever. She adjusted her glasses until they were just crooked enough to be annoying. Thought you were going to die. Glad to disappoint you. Now. She shrugged. You still owe me a year of service. We're bound, whether you like it or not. I sighed. It was ever so wonderful to be back in Meg's company. I suppose I should thank you. I had a hazy memory of my delirium in the forest, Meg. Carrying me along, the trees seeming to part before us. How did you get us out of the woods? Her expression turned guarded. Dunno. Luck. She jabbed a thumb at Will Solace. From what he's been telling me, it's a good thing we got out before nightfall. Why? Will started to answer, then apparently thought better of it. I should let Sharon explain. Come on. I rarely visited Camp Half-Blood in winter. The last time had been three years ago, when a girl named the Lear Grace crash-landed my bus in the canoe lake. I expected the camp to be sparsely populated. I knew most demigods only came for the summer, leaving a small core of year-enders during the school term, those who for various reasons found camp the only safe place they could live. Still, I was struck by how few demigods I saw. If cabin seven was any indication, each god's cabin could hold beds for about 20 campers. That meant a maximum capacity of 400. Demigods, enough for several phalanxes or one really amazing yacht party. Yet, as we walked across camp, I saw no more than a dozen people. In the fading light of sunset, a lone girl was scaling the climbing wall as larva flowed down either side. At the lake, a crew of three checked the rigging on the trireme. Some campers had found reasons to be outside just so they could gawk at me. Over by the hearth, one young man sat polishing his shield, watching me in its reflective surface. Another fellow glared at me as he spliced barbed wire outside the R's cabin. From the awkward way he walked, I assumed he was Sherman Young of the recently kicked crotch. In the doorway of the Hermes cabin, two girls giggled and whispered as I passed. Normally this sort of attention wouldn't have faced me. My magnetism was understandably irresistible. But now my face burned. Meet the manly paragon of romance, reduced to a gawky, inexperienced boy. I would have screamed at the heavens for this unfairness, but that would have been super embarrassing. We made our way through the fallow strawberry fields. Up on Half-Blood Hill, the Golden Fleece. Glinted in the lowest branch of a tall pine tree. Whiffs of steam rose from the head of Peleus, the guardian dragon coiled around the base of the trunk. Next to the tree, the Athena Parthenos looked angry red in the sunset. Or perhaps she just wasn't happy to see me. Athena had never gotten over our little tiff during the Trojan War. Halfway down the hillside, I spotted the Oracle's cave, its entrance shrouded by thick burgundy curtains. The torches on either side stood unlit, usually a sign that my prophetess, Rachel Dare, was not in residence. I wasn't sure whether to be disappointed or relieved. Even when she was not channeling prophesies, Rachel was a wise young lady. I had hoped to consult her about my problems. On the other hand, since her prophetic power had apparently stopped working, which I suppose in some small part was my fault, 
I wasn't sure Rachel would want to see me. She would expect explanations from her main man, and while I had invented mansplaining and was its foremost practitioner, I had no answers to give her. The dream of the flaming bus stayed with me, the groovy crowned woman urging me to find the gates, the ugly mauve suited man threatening to burn the oracle. Well, the cave was right there. I wasn't sure why the woman in the crown was having such trouble finding it, or why the ugly man would be so intent on burning its gates, which amounted to nothing more than purple curtains. Unless the dream was referring to something other than the Oracle of Delphi. I rubbed my throbbing temples. I kept reaching for memories that weren't there, trying to plunge into my vast lake of knowledge only to find it had been reduced to a kiddie pool. You simply can't do much with a kiddie pool brain. On the porch of the big house, a dark haired young man was waiting for us. He wore faded black trousers, a Ramones t shirt, bonus points for musical taste, and a black leather bomber jacket. At his side hung a Stygian iron sword. I remember you, I said. Is it Nicholas, son of Hades? Nico di Angelo. He studied me, his eyes sharp and colorless, like broken glass. So it's true. You're completely mortal. There's an aura of death around you, a thick possibility of death. Meg snorted. Sounds like a weather forecast. I did not find this amusing. Being face to face with the son of Hades, I recalled the many mortals I had sent to the underworld with my plague arrows. It had always seemed like good clean fun, meeting out richly deserved punishments for wicked deeds. Now, I began to understand the terror in my victim's eyes. I did not want an aura of death hanging over me. I definitely did not want to stand in judgment before Nico di Angelo's father. We'll put his hand on Nico's shoulder. Nico, we need to have another talk about your people. Skills. Hey, I'm just stating the obvious. If this is Apollo, and he dies, we're all in trouble. We'll turn to me. I apologize for my boyfriend. Nico rolled his eyes. Could you not, would you prefer a special guy? Will asked. Or significant other. Significant annoyance, in your case, Nico grumbled. Oh, I'll get you for that. Meg wiped her dripping nose. You guys fight a lot. I thought we were going to see a centaur. And here I am. The screen door opened. Churin trotted out, ducking his head to avoid the doorframe. From the waist up, he looked every bit the professor he often pretended to be in the mortal world. His brown wool jacket had patches on the elbows. His plaid dress shirt did not quite match his green tie. His beard was neatly trimmed, but his hair would have failed the tidiness inspection required for a proper rat's nest. From the waist down, he was a white stallion. My old friend smiled, though his eyes were stormy and distracted. Apollo, it's good you are. Here. We need to talk about the disappearances. Check your spam folder the prophesies might be there now. Well, I'm stumped. Bye. Meg gawked. He he really is a centaur. Well spotted, I said. I suppose the lower body of a horse is what gave him away. She punched me in the arm. Churin, I said, this is Meg McCaffrey my new master and wellspring of aggravation. You were saying something about disappearances. Churin's tail flicked. His hooves clopped on the planks of the porch. He was immortal, yet his visible age seemed to vary from century to century. I did not remember his whiskers ever being so grey, or the lines around his eyes so pronounced. Whatever was happening at camp must not have been helping his stress levels. Welcome, Meg. Churin tried for a friendly tone, which I thought quite heroic, seeing as, well, Meg. 
I understand you showed great bravery in the woods. You brought Apollo here despite many dangers. I'm glad to have you at Camp Half-Blood. Thanks, said Meg. You're really tall. Don't you hit your head on light fixtures. Churin chuckled. Sometimes. If I want to be closer to human size, I have a magical wheelchair. That allows me to compact my lower half into, actually, that's not important now. Disappearances, I prompted. What has disappeared? Not what, but who, Churin said. Let's talk inside. Will, Nico, could you please tell the other campers we'll gather for dinner in one hour? I'll give everyone an update then. In the meantime, no one should roam the camp alone. Use the buddy system. Understood. Will looked at Nico. Will you be my buddy? You are a dork, Nico announced. The two of them strolled off bickering. At this point, you may be wondering how I felt seeing my son with Nico D. I. Angelo. I'll admit I did not understand Will's attraction to a child of hates, but if the dark foreboding type was what made Will happy. Oh. Perhaps some of you are wondering how I felt seeing him with a boyfriend rather than a girlfriend. If that's the case, please. We gods are not hung up about such things. I myself have had. Let's see, 33 mortal girlfriends and 11 mortal boyfriends. I've lost count. My two. Greatest loves were, of course, Daphne and Hyacinthus, but when you're a god as popular as I am. Hold on. Did I just tell you who I liked? I did, didn't I? Gods of Olympus, forget I mentioned their names. I am so embarrassed. Please don't say anything. In this mortal life, I've never been in love with anyone. I am so confused. Churin led us into the living room, where comfy leather couches made A.V. facing the stone fireplace. Above the mantel, a stuffed leopard head was snoring contentedly. Is it alive? Meg asked. Quite. Churin trotted over to his wheelchair. That's Seymour. If we speak quietly, we should be able to avoid waking him. Meg immediately began exploring the living room. Knowing her, she was searching for small objects to throw at the leper to wake him up. Churin settled into his wheelchair. He placed his rear legs into the false compartment of the seat, then backed up, magically compacting his equine hindquarters until he looked like a man sitting down. To complete the illusion, hinge front panel swung closed, giving him fake human legs. Normally those legs were fitted with slacks and loafers to augment his professor disguise, but... Today it seemed Churin was going for a different look. That's new, I said. Churin glanced down at his shapely female mannequin legs, dressed in fishnet stockings and red sequined high heels. He sighed heavily. I see the Hermes cabin have been watching Rocky Horror Picture Show again. I will have to have a chat with them. Rocky Horror Picture Show brought back fond memories. I used to cosplay as Rocky at the midnight showings, because, naturally, the character's perfect physique was based on my own. Let me guess, I said. Connor and Travis still are the pranksters. From a nearby basket, Churin grabbed a flannel blanket and spread it over his fake legs, though the ruby shoe still peeked out at the bottom. Actually, Travis went off to college last autumn, which has mellowed Connor quite a bit. Meg looked over from the old Pac-Man arcade game. I poked that guy Connor in the eyes. Churin winced. That's nice, dear, at any rate, we have Julia van Gold and Alice Miazawa now. They have taken up pranking duty. You'll meet them soon enough. I recalled the girls who had been giggling at me from the Hermes cabin doorway. I felt myself blushing all over again. Churin gestured toward the couches. Please sit. 
Meg moved on from Pac-Man, having given the game 20 seconds of her time, and began literally climbing the wall. Dormant grapevines festooned the dining area, no doubt the work of my old friend Dionysius. Meg scaled one of the thicker trunks, trying to reach the gorgon hair chandelier. Ah, Meg, I said, perhaps you should watch the orientation film while Turin and I talk. I know plenty, she said. I talked to the campers while you were passed out. Safe place for modern demigods. Blar, blar, blar. Oh, but the film is very good, I urged. I shot it on a tight budget in the 1950s, but some of the camera work was revolutionary. You should really. The grapevine peeled away from the wall. Meg crashed to the floor. She popped up completely. Unscathed, then spotted a platter of cookies on the sideboard. Are those free? Yes, child, Churin said. Bring the tea as well, would you? So we were stuck with Meg, who draped her legs over the couch's armrest, jumped on cookies, and threw crumbs at Seymour's snoring head whenever Churin wasn't looking. Churin poured me a cup of Darjeeling. I'm sorry Mr. D is not here to welcome you. Mr. D. Meg asked. Dionysius, I explained. The god of wine. Also the director of this camp. Churin handed me my tea. After the battle with Gayer, I thought Mr. D might return to camp, but he never did. I hope he's all right. The old centaur looked at me expectantly, but I had nothing to share. The last six months were a complete void, I had no idea what the other Olympians might be up to. I don't know anything, I admitted. I hadn't said those words very often in the last four millennia. They tasted bad. I sipped my tea, but that was no less bitter. I'm a bit behind on the news. I was hoping you could fill me in. Churin did a poor job hiding his disappointment. I see. I realized he had been hoping for help and guidance, the exact same things I needed from him. As a god, I was used to lesser beings relying on me, praying for this and pleading for that. But now that I was mortal, being relied upon was a little terrifying. So what is your crisis? I asked. You have the same look Cassandra had in Troy, or Jim Bowie. At the Alamo, as if you're under siege. Turin did not dispute the comparison. He cupped his hands around his tea. You know that during the war with Geir, the Oracle of Delphi stopped receiving prophesies. In fact, all known methods of divining the future suddenly failed. Because the original cave of Delphi was retaken, I said with a sigh, trying not to feel picked on. Meg bounced a chocolate chip off Seymour the leopard's nose. Oracle of Delphi. Percy mentioned that. Percy Jackson. Turin sat up. Percy was with you. For a time. I recounted our battle in the peach orchard and Percy's return to New York. He said he would drive out this weekend if he could. Turin looked disheartened, as if my company alone wasn't good enough. Can you imagine? At any rate, he continued, we hoped that once the war was over, the oracle might start working again. When it did not, Rachel became concerned. Who's Rachel? Meg asked. Rachel Dare, I said. The oracle. Thought the oracle was a place. It is. Then Rachel is a place, and she stopped working. Had I still been a god, I would have turned her into a blue belly lizard and released her into the wilderness never to be seen again. The thought soothed me. The original Delphi was a place in Greece, I told her. A cavern filled with volcanic fumes, where people would come to receive guidance from my priestess, the Pythia. Pythia. Meg giggled. That's a funny word. Yes. Har har. So the oracle is both a place and a person. When the Greek gods relocated to America back in, what was it, 
Turin, 1860. Turin seesawed his hand. More or less. I brought the oracle here to continue speaking prophesies on my behalf. The power has passed down from priestess to priestess over the years. Rachel Dare is the present oracle. From the cookie platter, Meg plucked the only Oreo, which I had been hoping to have myself. Millimeter K. Is it too late to watch that movie? Yes, I snapped. Now, the way I gained possession of the Oracle of Delphi in the first place was by killing this monster called Python who lived in the depths of the cavern. A python like the snake, Meg said. Yes and no. The snake species is named after Python the monster, who is also rather snaky, but he was much bigger and scarier and devours small girls who talk too much. At any rate, last August, while I was indisposed, my ancient foe Python was released from Tartarus. He reclaimed the cave of Delphi. That's why the oracle stopped working. But if the oracle is in America now, why does it matter if some snake monster takes over its old cave? That was about the longest sentence I had yet heard her speak. She'd probably done it just to spite me. It's too much to explain, I said. You'll just have to. Meg? Turin gave her one of his heroically tolerant smiles. The original site of the oracle is like the deepest taproot of a tree. The branches and leaves of prophecy may extend across the world, and Rachel Dare may be our loftiest branch, but if the taproot is strangled, the whole tree is endangered. With Python back in residence at his old lair, the spirit of the oracle has been completely blocked. Oh. Meg made a face at me. Why didn't you just say so? Before I could strangle her like the annoying taproot she was, Turin refilled my teacup. The larger problem, he said, is that we have no other source of prophesies. Who cares? Meg asked. So you don't know the future? Nobody knows the future. Who cares? I shouted. Meg McCaffrey, prophesies are the catalysts for every important event, every quest or battle, disaster or miracle, birth or death. Prophesies don't simply foretell the future. They shape it. They allow the future to happen. I don't get it. Turin cleared his throat. Imagine prophesies are flower seeds. With the right seeds, you can grow any garden you desire. Without seeds, no growth is possible. Oh. Meg nodded. That would suck. I found it strange that Meg, a street urchin and dumpster warrior, would relate so well to garden metaphors, but Turin was an excellent teacher. He had picked up on something about the girl, an impression that had been lurking in the back of my mind as well. I hoped I was wrong about what it meant, but with my luck, I would be right. I usually was. So where is Rachel Dare? I asked. Perhaps if I spoke with her. Turin set down his tea. Rachel planned to visit us during her winter vacation, but she never did. It might not mean anything. I leaned forward. It was not unheard of for Rachel Dare to be late. She was artistic, unpredictable, impulsive, and rule-averse, all qualities I dearly admired. But it wasn't like her not to show up at all. Or? I asked. Or it might be part of the larger problem, Turin said. Prophesies are not the only things that have failed. Travel and communication have become difficult in the last few months. We haven't heard from our friends at Camp Jupiter in weeks. No new demigods have arrived. Sutters aren't reporting from the field. Iris messages no longer work. Iris what? Meg asked. Two-way visions, I said. A form of communication overseen by the rainbow goddess. Iris has always been flighty. Except that normal human communications are also on the fritz, 
Turin said. Of course, phones have always been dangerous for demigods, yeah, they attract monsters, Meg agreed. I haven't used a phone in forever. A wise move, Turin said. But recently our phones have stopped working altogether. Mobile, landline, internet, it doesn't seem to matter. Even the archaic form of communication known as email is strangely unreliable. The messages simply don't arrive. Did you look in the junk folder? I offered. I fear the problem is more complicated, Churin said. We have no communication with the outside world. We are alone and understaffed. You are the first newcomers in almost two months. I frowned. Percy Jackson mentioned nothing of this. I doubt Percy is even aware, Churin said. He's been busy with school. Winter is normally our quietest time. For a while, I was able to convince myself that the communication failures were nothing but an inconvenient happenstance. Then the disappearances started. In the fireplace, a log slipped from the andion. I may or may not have jumped in my seat. The disappearances, yes. I wiped drops of tea from my pants and tried to ignore Meg snickering. Tell me about those. Three in the last month, Turin said. First it was Cecil MacHarrett's from the Hermes cabin. One morning his bunk was simply empty. He didn't say anything about wanting to leave. No one saw him. Go. And in the past few weeks, no one has seen or heard from him. Children of Hermes do tend to sneak around, I offered. At first, that's what we thought, said Turin. But a week later, Ellis Wakefield disappeared from the Ars cabin. Same story, empty bunk, no signs that he had either left on his own or was, are, taken. Ellis was an impetuous young man. It was conceivable he might have charged off on some ill-advised adventure, but it made me uneasy. Then this morning we realized a third camper had vanished, Miranda Gardner, head of the Demeter cabin. That was the worst news of all. Meg swung her feet off the armrest. Why is that the worst? Miranda is one of our senior counselors, Turin said. She would never leave on her own without notice. She is too smart to be tricked away from camp and too powerful to be forced. Yet something happened to her, something I can't explain. The old centaur faced me. Something is very wrong, Apollo. These problems may not be as. Alarming as the rise of Kronos or the awakening of Geir, but in a way I find them even more. Unsettling, because I have never seen anything like this before. I recalled my dream of the burning sun bus. I thought of the voices I'd heard in the woods, urging me to wander off and find their source. These demigods? I said. Before they disappeared, did they act unusual in any way? Did they report, hearing things? Turin raised an eyebrow. Not that I am aware of. Why? I was reluctant to say more. I didn't want to cause a panic without knowing what we were facing. When mortals panic, it can be an ugly scene, especially if they expect me to fix the problem. Also, I will admit I felt a bit impatient. We had not yet addressed the most important issues, mine. It seems to me, I said, that our first priority is to bend all the camp's resources to helping me regain my divine state. Then I can assist you with these other problems. Churin stroked his beard. But what if the problems are connected, my friend? What if the only... Way to restore you to Olympus is by reclaiming the Oracle of Delphi, thus freeing the power of Prophecy. What if Delphi is the key to it all? I had forgotten about Turin's tendency to lay out obvious and logical conclusions that I tried to avoid thinking about. It was an infuriating habit. In my present state, that's impossible. 
I pointed at Meg. Right now, my job is to serve this demigod, probably for a year. After I've done whatever tasks she assigns me, Zeus will judge that my sentence has been served, and I can once again become a god. Meg pulled apart a fig newton. I could order you to go to this Delphi place. No? My voice cracked in mid-shriek. You should assign me easy tasks, like starting a rock band, or just hanging out. Yes, hanging out is good. Meg looked unconvinced. Hanging out isn't a task. It is if you do it right. Camp Half-Blood can protect me while I hang out. After my year of servitude is up, I'll become a god. Then we can talk about how to restore Delphi. Preferably, I thought, by ordering some demigods to undertake the quest for me. Apollo, Turin said, if demigods keep disappearing, we may not have a year. We may not have the strength to protect you. And, forgive me, but Delphi is your responsibility. I tossed up my hands. I wasn't the one who opened the doors of death and let Python out. Blame Gaia. Blame Zeus for his bad judgment. When the giants started to wake, I drew up a very clear 20-point plan of action to protect Apollo and also you other gods, but he didn't even read it. Meg tossed half of her cookie at Seymour's head. I still think it's your fault. Hey, look. He's awake. She said this as if the leopard had decided to wake up on his own rather than being beamed in the I with a fig newton. Rar Seymour complained. Churin wheeled his chair back from the table. My dear, in that jar on the mantel, you'll find some snore sages. Why don't you feed him dinner? Apollo and I will wait on the porch. We left Meg happily making three-point shots into Seymour's mouth with the treats. Once Churin and I reached the porch, he turned his wheelchair to face me. She's an interesting demigod. Interesting is such a non judgmental term. She really summoned a carpos. Well, the spirit appeared when she was in trouble. Whether she consciously summoned it, I don't know. She named him Peaches. Churin scratched his beard. I have not seen a demigod with the power to summon grain spirits in a very long time. You know what it means. My feet began to quake. I have my suspicions. I'm trying to stay positive. She guided you out of the woods, Turin noted. Without her, yes, I said. Don't remind me. It occurred to me that I'd seen that keen look in Turin's eyes before when he'd assessed. Achilles' sword technique and Ajaxer's skill with a spear. It was the look of a seasoned coach scouting new talent. I'd never dreamed the centaur would look at me that way, as if I had something to prove to him, as if my mettle were untested. I felt so, so objectified. Tell me, Turin said, what did you hear in the woods? I silently cursed my big mouth. I should not have asked whether the missing demigods had heard anything strange. I decided it was fruitless to hold back now. Turin was more perceptive than your average horseman. I told him what I'd experienced in the forest and afterward in my dream. His hands curled into his lap blanket. The bottom of it rose higher above his red sequined pumps. He looked about as worried as it is possible for a man to look while wearing fishnet stockings. We will have to warn the campers to stay away from the forest, he decided. I do not understand. What is happening, but I still maintain it must be connected to Delphi, and your present, our, situation. The Oracle must be liberated from the monster python. We must find a way. I translated that easily enough, I must find a way. Turin must have read my desolate expression. Come, come, old friend, he said. You have done it before. Perhaps you are not a god now but the first time you killed Python it was no challenge at all. 
Hundreds of storybooks have praised the way you easily slew your enemy. Yes, I muttered. Hundreds of storybooks. I recalled some of those stories, I had killed Python without breaking a sweat. I flew to the mouth of the cave, called him out, unleashed an arrow, and boom, one dead giant snake monster. I became Lord of Delphi, and we all lived happily ever after. How did storytellers get the idea that I vanquished Python so quickly? All right, possibly it's because I told them so. Still, the truth was rather different. For centuries after our battle, I had bad dreams about my old foe. Now I was almost grateful for my imperfect memory. I could not recollect all of the nightmarish details of my fight with Python, but I did know he had been no pushover. I had needed all my godly strength, my divine powers, and the world's most deadly bow. What chance would I have as a sixteen-year-old mortal with acne, ham the damn clothes, and the NOM de guerre Lester Propartipolos? I was not going to charge off to Greece and get myself killed. Thank you very much, especially not without my son chariot or the ability to teleport. I'm sorry, gods. Do not fly commercial. I tried to figure out how to explain this to Turin in a calm, diplomatic way that did not involve stomping my feet or screaming. I was saved from the effort by the sound of a conch horn in the distance. That means dinner. The center forced a smile. We will talk more later, eh? For now, let's celebrate your arrival.